Welcome and hello. I was in the middle of acknowledging the region. So there was a moment of electricity uh, as I was calling out our acknowledgement to the uh, long-standing debt that we owe the Cahuilla, the Tongva, the Rusenyu and Serrano peoples for their care for the air, water, and land in this region. And this is a particularly poignant subject to be focusing on um, as we acknowledge our debt to them in this region. We have the responsibility to acknowledge that, to call it out, to contribute to this labor, and to carry forward this co-labor into the future. So we thank them and we thank you for being here. I'm grateful to my co-hosts and to all of you. Uh, we're grateful to the Palm Desert Partners for your uh, material, and emotional, and physical support of the center. We're grateful to the Osher Lifelong Learning members for your commitment to intellectual life of the mind and for a lifetime of learning. If you are interested in this topic, which I think you are, if you've hung with us uh, past our uh, exciting beginning here, then you might be interested in another event coming up on April 6th. We have a series called Science Fiction and, and the first installment will be Science Fiction and Climate Crisis. Uh, we'll be featuring the Hugo and Nebula award-winning author Kim Stanley Robinson in conversation with some folks and it's, it looks to be an exciting event. Um, and we also have a project called the Patriotism Project, a series of four community conversations. We hope you'll find that information on either the Osher site, the Palm Desert site, or our own website at ideasandsociety.ucr.edu. All right, enough of that. Let's quickly segue into how this night will go. Uh, we are going to transition to uh, two folks. <laughs> Hopefully they're also going to be here with us. Um, we have two faculty members from the campus here to present their views on pivotal moments in environmental history. So they'll have each about five to seven minutes to present their take on this topic. Then they'll have a few minutes to develop a conversation between the two of them, and then we'll open it up to all of us to be able to ask questions and sort of tease out some of these lines of thinking as we think about the moments in the past uh, in the movements toward environmental consciousness, justice, and, and uh, that builds this long history, and then think about the current moment and where we might go in the future. So I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be presenting here tonight. So first up will be Philip Lehman. He's an assistant professor of history at UC Riverside. And before coming to Southern California, he worked as a researcher at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, Germany. He's published on the history of colonial science and early climate change theories, quite interesting. And he's currently putting the finishing touches on a manuscript that examines the long history of climate engineering in North Africa and Europe from the late 19th to the middle of the 20th century. And our second presenter tonight is Jade S. Sasser. She's an associate professor in the Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies. And her work explores how environmental problems, such as climate change and toxic exposures, intersects with women's bodies, women's health, rights, and reproduction. Her first book on infertile ground, population control, and women's rights in the era of climate change was published in 2018 by NYU Press, and she's currently engaged in several research projects and the intersections of climate justice activism, energy access, and environmental emotions. So obviously they come to us with a wealth of experience, so let me get out of the way and welcome Philip well, welcome Philip in to present for us first. Philip, are you ready? Yes, you're both ready. All right, so I'll I hand am. it off to you. Um, thank you very much, Catherine, for the introduction. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us for this event. Uh, I'm going to go share my screen now, if I can do that. Let's see. All right, I hope that works for everybody. Jade, can you give me a thumbs up if, if you can see the a black screen right now? I see a black screen, yes. Perfect. <laughs> All right, um, so I think um, Jade and I, we picked very different pivotal moments uh, in the history of the environment or the history uh, of um, 
uh, environmental science, environmental activism. And I would love to hear also from the audience afterwards what you would pick as your most pivotal or one of the most pivotal moments in environmental history. Uh, I would like to start my very short talk today with a picture that most of you have seen um, probably in one context or another. It is the blue marble photograph taken from aboard the Apollo 17 spacecraft in 1972. And it has become an iconic image for the environmental movement and it has become a symbol of both the interconnectedness but also the fragility of the earth, a small um, blue planet floating in the vastness of space. But that is not what I want to talk about today. Instead, I would like to show that both a global perspective and a sense of environmental precariousness or environmental crises were there long before 1972 uh, and even before the 20th century. And one could identify a number of different events and developments in that history of global environmental consciousness. But the one that I have chosen today um, is, I think, one of the uh, most important ones, uh, but also one of the maybe most forgotten or um, least known ones. And so I will take you here, which despite appearances uh, are not the mountains surrounding Palm Springs, but rather mountains in the Libyan desert, which is one of the driest parts of the Sahara in North Africa. On this map, um, showing the relative aridity of North Africa. The Libyan desert is slapdash in the middle of the dark red zone that is the most arid zone um, on the border of modern day Libya and Egypt. And the Libyan desert uh, was also a waypoint on the travels of this man here with the impressive facial hair. His name is Heinrich Barth, a German geographer in the pay of the British government, and thus a kind of standard example of a 19th century explorer. And I won't go into the details of his travels here, except to say that he was later celebrated in Europe as the discoverer of rock carvings and paintings in the Libyan desert. And these rock paintings were um, this is one example of them, um, often portraying um, human hunters and large mammals, which had been, uh, and these rock paintings had been preserved by the arid climates of the desert. And I say that Bart was celebrated as the discoverer of these images because, of course, the story was much more complicated and much more colonial than that. Um, on his travels in the 1850s, Bart had uh, been taking notes about all kinds of geo geological, biological, and ethnographic information on his travels. And it was, in fact, his um, North African guides, um, seasoned caravan travelers who already knew about the rock art and led Heinrich Bart and the other European travel companions to these um, rock paintings and rock carvings. And Bart then copied these paintings into his notebook, and he wrote some lines at this point about um, the evidence that these paintings, these images provided about um, drastic environmental changes that must have happened uh, and that had changed the climatic conditions in the Sahara. After all, Bart was at this point standing in one of the most arid spots in the Sahara and he was looking at hunting scenes um, portraying thriving human um, societies and wildlife and also domesticated animals. Um, or uh, in one case, oh, so you see another example here, and in one case that was made famous then by the English Patient, um, the novel by Michael Ondatje, uh, rock art portraying humans swimming, once again, um, quite a contrast to the climatic conditions of the Libyan desert. So what had happened to the environment to change so drastically from about 2000 years ago, or at least 2000 years ago, is the time that um, Heinrich Barth dated the, the rock art too. And although Barth himself seemed to forget about the rock art rather quickly, his ruminations um, printed after his return to Europe would inspire a solid and ongoing discussion about large environmental and climatic changes in Africa. And at this point, there were many ideas about environmental changes floating around, most often tied to you know, colonial legitimization strategies of indigenous neglect of nature and the alleged superiority of European stewardship. But the discussion that Bart's account inspired was not about local changes brought about by deforestation or grazing animals, 
but seem to gesture towards a much larger change, some kind of continental or maybe even the global process with the power to turn vast areas of fertile land into desert, as had happened with the Sahara. Um, and so now the debate about these large climatic changes ultimately petered out um, around the turn of the 20th century. And there was no scientific consensus what had actually happened. And climatologists at this point, they could not agree whether they, are, whether they had actually been um, these large climatic changes that Bart and some others were arguing for, nor could they explain what could have caused these changes. There were ideas about um, orbital changes of the earth, uh, sunspots, volcanic activity, and there was even already a um, kind of nascent discussion about the effect of greenhouse gases on um, climatic conditions, but none of these models um, could be proven or disproven, uh, and thus uh, the discussion, as I said, petered out um, and people uh, kind of jumped off uh, the, uh, the discussion around the turn of the 20th century, although there were some continuing discussions about changing climates, especially in, in Africa, the Middle East, and in other, uh, in other um, arid regions around the world. But, and this is why I'm showing you this map that's on the screen right now, the debate about North African climate was important because it inspired practitioners at that time to think about large scale or even global climatic changes that went far beyond single well-defined and circumscribed places. And it also provided a blueprint to think about not just a collection of different local climates, but something resembling global climate that stretched around the entire globe, um, of course with local variations, but that became kind of the global climate system that we talk about today and the global climate that we talk about today. And you can see evidence of that in the first maps of global climates that were produced during the time in the late 19th century, such as the one on screen um, that was produced by the Russian German climatologist Vladimir Köppen. Um, he published that in a, a German journal uh, at that time, uh, and it showed the, as he called it, the world climates, or the world climate in the singular even. And it was this vision of an interconnected globe rather than the early discussions about global climatic changes that did survive into the 20th century uh, and also long before the blue marble photograph. And just as some kind of closing comments after this kind of whirlwind uh, history of the, um, of the rock art and um, the climate change debate that was inspired by them, I just want to add one thought here that may connect to some of the issues that um, Jade will talk about next. Um, because the data that European scientists used to construct maps like the one on the screen right now were products of colonial science. The data were collected by Europeans and by Africans working for or often being forced to work for colonial governments all around the world. And thus the origins of modern climate science are deeply colonial and deeply racial as well. And that's a dimension that is usually hidden by smooth data tables or also these smooth maps of world climates um, and the quite beautiful maps of world climates that you see here on the screen. So that's it for my part and I'll hand it over to Jade right now. Thank you, Philip. I think we will have lots to discuss uh, in the discussion portion. So my slides will be shown for me if, uh, if the first slide can be pulled up now. Okay, thank you. So my pivotal moment in environmental history is the moment at which the environmental justice movement started. And I chose this moment for a couple of reasons. The first being I'm not an environmental historian. However, this moment is the single most important pivotal moment that shapes my work and my engagements around environmentalism, environmental activism, um, and environmental and climate justice. And it's also a near history that many people are completely unaware of. 
I think most or probably all of us at this point have heard the term environmental justice. Many people don't know specifically how it is defined and many people don't know um, how this uh, sort of framework and movement arose. So I wanna give us some brief historical context for that. Okay, so those that are familiar with environmental justice typically point to an event that happened in 1982 when the state of North Carolina announced a plan to move soil that had been heavily contaminated uh, with PCBs, toxic persistent pollutants. They were going to move this soil from um, 210 miles of state roadside land, and they were going to place this contaminated soil in a landfill in a place called Warren County. Warren County happened to be the county in the state with the highest proportion of Black residents and the second highest proportion of impoverished residents, again, in the entire state. So that decision by the state of North Carolina triggered a wave of protests in the local community. And that's what you see in the slide here. These protests were based on civil rights demonstrating strategies developed in the 50s and 60s. Um, they included things like the kinds of protests that we're familiar with, people carrying signs, picketing, uh, blocking traffic. But here in particular, we see an example of the kind of street theater um, or performance-based uh, protest strategies in which protesters in the community staged a die-in. So you have people laying in the roadway. They were not only blocking the trucks that were bringing that contaminated soil to be dumped in their community, but they were also doing a performative uh, display of what it would look like for people in this community to die as a result of these toxic wastes being located nearby contaminating soil and contaminating the water that they relied on. So again, these protests were widespread in this area. It was a rural county um, and they resulted in numerous arrests, including the arrest of an American congressman and dozens of other activists who tried to block the trucks. These ad activists and advocates actually lost their battle. So the state of North Carolina ultimately buried this contaminated soil in the county. Um, but there was a success that came out of this protest, which is that the controversy became uh, well known around the country and it crystallized the idea that the unevenness of the nation's environmental problems, specifically problems with toxic exposures, had something to do with race and poverty. Now, this was not the first time that communities of color had made that assertion or organized around environmental issues. In the 1960s, Latino farm workers in California led by Cesar Chavez fought for workplace rights, including protection from harmful pesticides. In 1967, African-American students in Houston took to the streets to oppose a city garbage dump in their community. And in 1968, residents of West Harlem in New York fought unsuccessfully against a local sewage treatment plant being based in their community. So this was not the first incident, but this Warren County protest marked the first instance in which an environmental protest led by people of color gained widespread national attention. However, I wanna argue that this was not the official start of the organized environmental justice movement. That start began uh, a couple of years later. So the year after these protests, the government's general accounting office produced a report that confirmed that hazardous waste in three states in the Southeast were disproportionately located near black communities. And so um, leaders of color began to get together and say, we know that these kinds of environmental toxic exposures have everything to do with the racial makeup of local communities, but we can't prove it, at least not systematically. We need a way of demonstrating that this isn't a series of isolated incidents. So in the year 1987, the United Church of Christ, through their Commission on Racial Justice, produced a report called Toxic Wastes and Race in the U.S. And if you can share the next slide, please. So this was a landmark report. That's a picture of the cover of the report on the left and on the right um, is an image of the launch event um, when that report was shared. 
This was a landmark report that demonstrated through a systematic nationwide analysis that three out of five Latino and Black Americans across the entire United States lived in communities that housed what the EPA called uncontrolled toxic waste sites, which means closed or abandoned sites that posed a threat to human health and the environment. So this report, it marked the first time that there was a systematic uh, analysis and systematic data provided um, that showed that the demographic makeup of nearby communities was the single most important variable in determining whether a toxic landfill or polluting industry would be located there. And of those demographic elements within a community, the race of community members, specifically Black and Latino race, were the most important variables making it likely that polluting industries or dump sites would be located nearby. Again, this was an absolute watershed moment because this type of systematic data had never been collected on such a broad scale before. And so three years later, building on this report, activists convened the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in Washington, DC. And at that meeting, they created a document formally articulating principles of environmental justice. Those principles provided the foundation of the movement that we now know as the EJ movement. And they called for things like affirming the sacredness of Mother Earth, environmental policies free of discrimination and racism, and the right of impacted communities to participate as equal partners at every level of environmental decision making. From there, building on these principles, activists and scholars defined environmental justice as an approach that identified environmental racism as a driving cause of the unequal distribution of environmental burdens and benefits in the places where we live, work, play, and pray. Finally, eight years later, and I'm wrapping up the comments now, um, eight years later in 1999, the climate justice movement arose with a landmark report called Greenhouse Gangsters versus Climate Justice. And this report drew directly on these EJ principles that were articulated through this report and subsequent meetings, but they broadened them to apply to regional and global level institutions and policies. Climate justice was defined as an approach recognizing that, quote, the solutions adopted to ward off global warming can't fall hardest on low income communities, communities of color, or the workers employed by the fossil fuel industry. Climate justice means fostering a just transition for these constituencies to a healthier and more just environment to work and live in. So here we are 20 years later, um, in 2019, the Green New Deal was introduced to Congress by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It's a plan that pushes us to finally, as a society, actualize those principles across our economy. It remains to be seen whether or not we will do so, um, but the progress or pro the process of achieving progress on environmental and climate justice continues. Um, and thankfully, there are concrete proposals um, introduced in government and pushed forward continuously by activists today. So I'll leave it there. And I think that Philip and I will have a brief conversation and then we'll open it up to everyone else. So I'm sure the two of you saw th threads and um, overlaps and topics. One obvious one, just to get the cross talk started as folks and, and, and folks, if you're listening, which I, I hope you are listening, this is fascinating. Please drop your questions in the Q&A button that you'll notice down at the bottom of the webinar screen. Um, you can use the chat for uh, other hellos and goodbyes, but we'll, we'll want questions for the panelists to be dropped in that Q&A window. So as you're getting your questions ready, one thing I noticed uh, between the two presentations, and please correct me <laughs> if, I, if I'm not noticing something that I should be noticing, please draw it to my attention. But I noticed, Philip, you and Jade, both, both of these pivotal moments relied on the kind of reproducible tools of analysis of bureaucracy and government. We have reports and maps and we have reports coming out and leveraging those tools, one to one that by the way, covers up the work of folks who, who were primary sources. And, and on the second hand, 
attempts to uncover folks who are being harmed by these um, government actions. So just as a sort of a soft prompt, what, what is your take on the ways in which your moments, although so dis disparate and so separated by time, tend to overlap? That's a great question, uh, Catherine. And for me, I actually intentionally chose this moment because there is a way in which um, the work that was already being done by activists who were drawing attention to the environmental harms being done in their communities, they weren't being taken seriously um, and their messages weren't being amplified on the scale at which they could bring about policy change. And so there was a lot of discussion over the decades, starting from the 60s when these kinds of movements, movements began to arise through until the early 80s, in which movement actors said, we know what is happening in our communities. We know that our community members are getting sick. We know that they are disproportionately getting sick and dying compared to members of other kinds of communities who are not dealing with the burden of these kinds of toxic exposures. We know it, but we don't have a way of systematically arguing our case in such a way that policy leaders, government officials, elected representatives, and others will actually pay attention and make policy changes. And so community members reached out uh, to leaders at this particular church, knowing that church leaders had engaged in a variety of different forms of activism, but that they also had the ability to do this research too and to amplify the research on a broader scale. And so in this instance, um, the legitimacy of scientific data is what made it possible for environmental justice to move from being a series of claims made by local communities of color to a national movement that was taken seriously by government leaders and the basis for systematic policy change. Yeah, maybe I'm gonna take this kind of into to a slightly different direction because uh, I think this, this issue of, of race, of environmental justice is um, so important and it's also such an important moment um, for the academy and for environmental history right now. So I am an environmental historian. I've attended the large conferences of environmental history over the past um, 10 years or so. And it has been quite interesting to see how this, this topic of, of race, of environmental justice has become much more prominent in the work of a lot of scholars. And I think this is particularly important for environmental his, history, which has been for a long time seen as, and with some justification, as a field that was dominated by not only white males, but also by white male narratives. Um, so I think this is a, a really important moment right now for environmental history to kind of uh, you know, take these topics and bring them to the forefront. And I'm also very happy to say that I, you know, I've been teaching a class in the history department at UCR about the politics of, an, of environment and I've had a lot of really, in, really interesting student projects. So they have to um, do a research project for this class at the end. And I've had some on the Superfund sites that are right here in Riverside, Riverside County. And that kind of, you know, show that these problems of, of Warren, Country are, uh, Warren County are still happening today. And you can see that, you know, right outside our door, if you look um, closely enough. Um, and then also kind of uh, this term, I had about 20 students in the class and five of them, without me really prompting them, although I may have, you know, given them, given them some reading material, chose topics um, with a very kind of dominant kind of uh, um, environmental justice dimension. So I think this is kind of really a moment for that. And I'm really happy to see that also in the work of, of students, um, of undergraduate students right now. And I think the then there's one point, Jade, that you brought up, and that's about um, scientific data or you know scientific reports and the importance of them. And I think this is something that is, you know, that in, in my research, uh, especially when I'm, I'm looking to kind of communicate not only with other historians but also with kind of a, a larger public, that I'm often kind of wondering about because what I'm talking about here is um, data that were collected in the late 19th century, mostly in colonial contexts. And this, as I say, is a deeply colonial, it's also a deeply kind of racial 
um, story that I'm talking about, but these are still, these are data that are still being used today in, in climate models. Um, and you wouldn't know that because usually the data, as I said, come in data tables, or, you know, if you look at, you know, IPCC reports or something, you don't even really know where the data is, is coming from. But this is kind of the, kind of the metadata that gets lost often in scientific communications, kind of the, the history behind how were these data actually collected? Where are they from? What were the conditions of the collection of these data? And I think this is a story that is also important to, to talk about. It's a story that's very difficult to get at often because these metadata are often not recorded or not very well recorded. They're in some archives uncategorized and you have to go and look around for a really long time to even find these and uncover these stories. I just wanna say in response briefly, Philip, I find it unbelievable, quite frankly, that anyone would still exist in a state of climate denialism, um, particularly given that the evidence or at least questions and scientific study around the existence of climactic changes, um, the theories and proposals around climate change have been in existence for so long and that these scientific debates have been in existence for so long as well. Um, and to go to your earlier points around student engagement and interest around questions of environment and climate justice, um, at UCR in the Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies, we have a major in sustainability studies. And most of our students in that major are deeply concerned with exactly um, these questions. What are the issues of environmental justice that they themselves, their families and communities have experienced? Um, their understandings around climate change are fully informed by these questions of climate justice. So they're coming into the classroom already with really sophisticated critiques of the fossil fuel industry, um, of how corporations uh, extract and use resources, of how communities of color, low-income communities, indigenous communities um, are really being burdened by the impacts of climate change while not experiencing the benefits that these other actors are um, are creating for themselves. And so what I find is really exciting is that young people are very much at the forefront of the movement for climate justice. But I think it's also important that um, we in older generations don't put all of the burden of responsibility on young people for finding all of the solutions and saving all of us when older generations have created and sustained the problem. Yeah, that is that is that's definitely true. Very important point there. And I think another anecdote, just kind of to your point on kind of the the engagement that students have even before you know coming to UCR or coming into the classroom is that you know I have them I have them usually read um, Merchants of of Doubt, um, kind of a book that uncovers the the background, um, the political and economic background to climate change denialism. And it is, it is well written, it's an engaging book, but also the student response that I often, often get now it is, yeah, we know that already. So like, let's move on from that, <laughs> um, which you know, I find really, really exciting that you know, the students are already one step further than, than, I, you know, than, than I think definitely I was at, at their age. So thank you for that. And I, I do see we have some questions. Tamara has generously volunteered to handle the questions and answers for us. Tamara, would you like to take the microphone? I will. Thank you. And um, I will have to mute myself as soon as my dog starts barking, just so you know. And hopefully it won't be in the midst of asking the first or any questions. Uh, so actually, the first one's in the chat, which is totally OK. Um, I found compelling your discussion that much of the early work on climate change in North America relied on coercive colonial tactics by European discoverers. But how did indigenous knowledge of climate change affect or not European scientific understanding of long-term climate change in the regions you study? Um, great question, Steve. Um, so it's 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 a very complex story, as in, in so many cases. But uh, 
because the indigenous contributions were often explicitly, uh, or I guess explicitly written out of the stories. And so it's a really kind of difficult job to uncover them. And uh, the longer kind of the 19th century went on, you also see less and less reference to indigenous knowledge appearing in um, climatological treatises or climatological articles. And I think this was also kind of going, going along with the kind of general thrust of um, colonial legitimization uh, attempted by, by European powers and also by the European scientists that worked uh, in and on Africa to devalue the knowledge of um, Africans and kind of put European knowledge on a pedestal to kind of have legitimization for the colonial efforts. But it still found uh, its way in there because when Europeans first uh, kind of started to survey and do climatological surveys of colonies in, in Africa, and they needed to do that because they wanted to know whether what kind of economic potential these colonies had, they kind of approached the the environments with a very European mindset of kind of, you know, regular seasons, usually four seasons and annual rainfall statistics, but that doesn't tell you very much in kind of um, semi-arid or arid environments, which work very different with kind of rainy seasons rather than kind of the, the European seasonality that we have. And there you can actually find kind of explicit references often to uh, indigenous knowledge and indig indigenous informants that, you know, basically taught the colonizers and the colonial scientists on how to report on climates in the region. And um, your question was particularly about kind of large climatic changes. And, and there it was often at least kind of earlier in the 19th century. This is really kind of the period from 1850 to 1870 um, before kind of the time of of high imperialism in the, in the late 19th century is that um, Europeans did often use um, narrative accounts and kind of uh, oral accounts by Africans to kind of argue for environmental changes that had happened, you know, over one, two, or maybe even um, further generations back. Um, on the other hand, though, yeah, as the 19th century went on and Europeans needed more um, climatological information about past environmental and climatic conditions, they then often valued Roman and Greek accounts from antiquity over um, African accounts. Thank you. I'll go to the next question. This one is in the Q&A. Alejandra says, thank you so much for these fascinating comments. I was really struck by how differently you both thought about what pivotal moments are. So I know you explained why these moments, but I would love to hear you think out loud about these differences. Thanks again, these talks are great, thank you. So that's to both of you. So I think uh, if I understand it correctly, the question is how we think of what constitutes a pivotal moment um, in and of itself, and I think that for me, that's a great question because what this history of environmental justice describes or reveals is that there are a series of pivotal moments. Um, and I'm the one who selected one and said, this was the pivotal moment uh, for my own reasons and the reasons being exactly what Philip just described. So the embodied knowledge of these communities of color was available um, and was being circulated for a number of years and it was being largely ignored. So why this moment was pivotal for me is because that sort of local embodied knowledge of communities of color was now elevated to a different plane and able to enact change that would reverberate um, through the decades around the world. There are local environmental justice movements in countries around the world. Climate justice is a global movement um, and it would not exist without this organizing and activism in environmental justice. Um, but again, the ability to go from local embodied knowledge of these really very marginalized community members to a cohesive organized movement on a national scale that was given attention. It's the, the question of scale that for me defines what made the moment pivotal. Mm 
That, that's actually a perfect transition point because it's also scale that I was thinking about though, kind of in a different way. Um, because for me, if you look at the environmental movement today and especially kind of also the, um, you know, climate change debates, uh, climate change politics that is happening today, it's often about the global, right? It's the global climate, it's global warming. And, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's an important term, but it's also a very problematic term. I, I won't go into the, the details of that, but I think uh, we definitely have something that resembles kind of a global um, environmental, global climatic vision these days that we think of the earth as kind of a single system um, and the climate as kind of a single system that works um, all around the globe. And uh, I think when you usually trace back these histories, and this is why I started with Blue Marble, I think this is usually situated somewhere in the middle of the 20th century, which no doubt was an extremely important moment for that vision to really come to the forefront. But for me, it's always been interesting to kind of think about, well, you know, I think uh, if you go back to the 19th century, there is definitely something there already, and this scaling up um, is already happening, not quite as much in the public eye as it then does in the 20th century, but it is a process that has been going on much longer. And then, you know, the, the moment that I chose in the end is clearly from my own research and is something that I've been thinking about. You could also choose other ones, um, but I do think this, this is one that is really important and it's one that is, you know, pr mostly forgotten or at least kind of not uh, talked about very much. Thank you both. We have another question. This is from our friend, Jennifer Prado. Uh, regarding the disconnection between the data and the sources and stories behind them, I'm wondering how much of a factor do either of you think that perhaps the veil of objectivity under which science is conducted, reported, et cetera, plays in how we address environmental justice? That's a great question. And I would like to say that when it comes to environmental justice, this was completely citizen driven science. And what I mean by citizen is members of the affected communities organized together. They called for this study to be done. Um, they organized with leaders of the church. They participated in the racial justice uh, commission that produced the report. Um, so I would argue that there, the veil of objectivity is a very permeable veil in this instance because uh, this is values driven science in which the most impacted uh, community leaders were at the helm. And they specifically called for a scientific report to be written in order to legitimize all of the organizing and activist work that they had already been doing that wasn't being legitimated on a broader scale. Um, I would argue though that where we are today <clears throat> is very different. I think there's a broad recognition that the lived embodied experiences of frontline communities, those that are impacted most by environmental and climate injustice, that the stories, the lived experiences um, speak with authority and power. And so there certainly is scholarship uh, that is produced um, to sustain environmental and climate justice um, work. But community stories, narrative storytelling, uh, community testimonials, and certainly community organizing and activism are very strongly valued within these movements, and they're not eclipsed or overshadowed uh, by science. In fact, that's one of the explicit sort of things that both EJ and CJ principles reject, which is a scientific perspective that does not embrace and foreground lived experiences of frontline communities. Um, yeah, that's a, uh, a really a deep question. And I think you know, the time that I'm working um, or my, my research focuses on the kind of second half of the 19th century is a really important point to look at there as well, because this, this is where we have um, the construction of the kind of disciplines that we know today, the construction of um, uh, 
scientific objectivity and the kind of setting of norms of what that would mean. And again, this was done in the context of European science, which was at that point a kind of very colonial science. And it tried to move um, away from embodied experience at that, at that point and tried to move away from anything that could be seen as subjective. Although even then, you know, as I said, it apportioned or it, um, still categorize things differently as you know African accounts would be categorized as too subjective to take into account whereas Roman and Greek accounts would be seen as for some reason objective so the, um, there's still kind of the sorting on under a very kind of European and colonial gaze that's going on of what is objective and what is not and I think even today I mean Jade you're completely right that there are movements to kind of dismantle this kind of idea of um, objectivity in science as well and kind of move towards new models of what scientific validity uh, would mean. But it is difficult to kind of, it's still there. We, we're still living with the with the heritage of the, of the late 19th century. And I think this is often also um, the point where kind of modern climate science um, it doesn't do the greatest job. And that is going from these kind of large visions of the global to what is actually going on on the in the local communities and what's what how it will climate change affect different communities differently i think there's a lot of people actually working on that but it's often not the climate scientists themselves and so um we you know uh, it, it would be and this is kind of what is being done more and more today too to build these kind of interdisciplinary groups but there you run into kind of problems of how can you know social scientists humanities scholars and um, climate scientists work together uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge today still i think um, and yeah uh, one a very important one thank you uh, we have a question from stephen jade i really enjoyed hearing about your work this question may come out of left field, but to what extent would you say the US is a leader or a laggard in terms of efforts across the globe to address these issues? To what extent are these movements supported or undermined by the nature of the dominant economic system? I know that is such a broad question, he says, that it cannot be addressed here, but I was just wondering how you sort out these questions. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I would answer that in two ways. I would say that when it comes to activist movements, the US is a leader, um, particularly around climate justice. So for example, we have a, a near history, um, a very strong, very engaged youth leadership from the United States participating in global scale climate policy meetings. So every year at the end of the year, um, there's a meeting called the COP or Conference of Parties meeting. It's a meeting in which policymakers, government officials and scientists and activists from around the world come together to, dis to, to discuss uh, progress toward shared uh, climate change policies, um, progress toward adapting to climate change, toward mitigating climate change and youth activists from the United States have consistently been at the forefront of pushing forward a climate justice agenda in partnership with youth from other countries around the world. Um, but I think that youth activists from the US have had a longer history of engaging um, with mentors um, and older activists here in the US who have developed these frameworks that have circulated to other places. Now that's on the activist scale. The other way that I want to answer is the question of the government scale. Um, the U.S. has always been a laggard um, on global climate change policy. And we all know that very recently, um, you know, politically, we were an outlier in the most embarrassing way because our government had pulled out of the Paris Agreement, which was the first legally binding international policy uh, to address climate change. We are now back in that agreement. But consistently from the first time that there was an international policy instrument to address climate change, which was the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, the United States did not ratify it. Um, I myself have participated in these international climate change meetings and the US is always discussed as the biggest, most important bad actor um, in terms of 
really not pushing the world forward on effective climate policy. So are we leaders? Yes, in terms of activism, especially with our youth. Are we laggards? Absolutely, in terms of government action. Thank you. Uh, we're near seven o'clock. I will ask one final question and then I'll kick it over to uh, Catherine. So um, we talked a lot about global um, actions. What are people doing to work toward environmental and climate justice locally in the Inland Empire and at UCR? Well, in the Inland Empire, um, Philip alluded to this. Uh, there is an organization called the Center for Community Action on Environmental Justice. They've been doing environmental justice work for decades now. Um, the organization started with a toxic landfill that was located on um, up kind of on a hill above a local community called Glen Avon, which is close to Riverside. And during a series of storms runoff from that toxic site uh, ran into a community, it ran into the streets and yards of a neighborhood and most disturbingly, it ran into the playground of um, an elementary school. And so parents and teachers became really concerned with the fact that no one was doing anything about it. And the site that had produced the toxins and dumped them there weren't even acknowledging what they had done. Through activism, that became the first California Superfund site. Um, their activism continues today. There's a lot of other EJ activism in the Inland Empire and at UCR. One thing that's going on is that I and others participate in um, what has just been developed, which is a system-wide UC Center for Climate Justice. And that center is launching on Earth Day, April 22nd, as well as the 23rd. People can come and participate virtually. There will be lots of activities. You can learn a lot about climate justice and have fun. There will be music and spoken word performances. So I'll send around a flyer. Please come. I don't have very much to add for that. I mean, on, in UCR, there's there's a number of kind of also interdisciplinary research groups, um, like the Breathe Cluster, for example, that deals with kind of air pollution and climate change as well. And there's there's other um, other research clusters, other kind of interdisciplinary um, groups that are working on on the issue. Uh, and yeah, and in the Inland Empire, there's a couple of groups uh, as well. And there's also a couple of local politicians that are really um, really concerned about this this problem. So I think it's always it makes a lot of sense sometimes to go to some of the the city town city hall meetings um, uh, and community meetings and kind of hear what's going on uh, in you know your community, whether it be Palm Springs or Riverside or San Bernardino. I do want to really quickly add one thing to one of the biggest fights in the Inland Empire around environmental justice today is the fight between the logistics industry and local communities. Um, the logistics industry is um, associated with a lot of air pollution because of diesel trucks that are running through the Inland Empire. And so CCAJ, the organization that, that I mentioned, they are at the forefront of a lot of efforts and coalition building to address that logistics industry and to amplify the voices of frontline communities who are exposed to chronic air pollution and to sort of bring this up to current context, um, long-term exposure to air pollution is associated with worse outcomes from COVID-19. So these issues are ongoing, um, they expand in new ways and we must remain vigilant and partner with community members in their struggles for justice. So, we could keep talking about this and we should keep talking about this. So I hope that everyone here in this virtual room with us will keep talking about all of these um, important points that you've raised. I want to ask by way of segue toward a transition back to uh, folks lives this evening away from this event. I want to ask you both to you, we've we've been reflecting in the past. We've talked about issues in the present. I want to ask you to take a little creative leap with me. And Philip, we'll start with you. <laughs> imagine yourself forward 100 years, looking back. What do you imagine will be a pivotal moment 
now? What, what do you think a pivotal moment that's happening now or a pivotal opportunity could be? A hundred years from now, you're looking back and someone's giving a talk at Palm Desert Center <laughs> and they say, this is the pivotal moment from 2021 or from this era. What would you, how would you respond to that, Philip? Ooh, that's a that's a difficult one, um, especially as a historian. I always feel very ill-equipped to answer these questions about the present. We don't like to talk about the present as historians, um, but uh, I do think um, I do think kind of the movement, and this is uh, you know a movement that is very much run by um, the younger generations for for climate justice and environmental justice on kind of. A global scale, you know, we really see that kind of these movements that were really national movements have come together and kind of formed um, as a kind of international or even kind of transnational group, with the help also, of course, of social media and kind of the ease of kind of communicating with one another. And I think that's that's going to be something that people will look back at and, and see as a very important um, kind of also a grassroots um, moment. Um, I would say looking back that what was pivotal about this time, especially 2020, is that it was a year in which a lot of silos were broken down. And what I mean by that is often before this current moment, people would talk about public health as something separate and distinct from climate change or environmental issues. And I'm hearing more and more people seeing the intersections of the two and the role of racial inequality and racial injustice that permeates both. So for me, I'm excited to see those walls breaking down. Um, I'm excited to hear more people recognizing that public health is not separate and distinct from environmental and climate injustice and neither are separate and dis distinct from racial and social inequality. And hopefully we can have better integrated policies because we're having more comprehensive, uh, integrated kinds of discussions. May it be so. And may we all be motivated and aware to do our part. <laughs> so thank you both. It's been a pleasure, pleasure to host you, a pleasure to listen to your research and to your reasons and to think these thoughts alongside you and everyone who joined us for the event. Thank you all. Please stay connected. Um, stay informed, and we hope to see you again at future events at Palm Desert Center, uh, at your meetings with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, or through the events at the Center for Ideas and Society. So, so long, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Be safe, be well, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye now.